morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Logan. I'm the chair of the board of directors for Sid Washington, and I'm super excited to see such a large and diverse crowd here today. According to our registration data, we have over 900 people attending our conference this year um, from the U.S. and from around the world, and that sets a new record for Sid Washington's annual conference. <laughs> Pretty exciting, huh? And I, I did say uh, that I hope this is because of the incredible learning events that we have programmed and the fascinating people that we've attracted to participate and not just because of the fabulous free breakfast that you all wanted to fight to get. I want to take a few minutes to give you an overview of this year's conference. This year we deliberately structured the conference to push us into new conversations with different actors who bring valuable perspectives on the ideas and innovations that we all need to consider in our collective effort to solve wicked problems and achieve lasting progress and impact. Today you'll hear from Fortune 500 companies about how we can forge meaningful partnerships to create positive change from investment leaders about how we can pioneer new ways forward in venture capital and development finance to reduce inequity and marginalization. From creative storytellers who offer us insight into new ways we can share our experiences beyond our traditional circles to raise awareness and generate support for common goals from development leaders inside and outside of government about how we must work differently and better in a world that is flatter, more polarized, and yet holds unimaginable promise if we collaborate for collective good and commit to sustainable and inclusive development to ensure no one is left behind. We also deliberately structured a variety of experiences for you to have new conversations. For example, for those of you who like to ask provocative questions in big audiences, we've built in substantial time for Q&A during our plenary and breakout sessions. For those of you who like to learn at your own pace, we encourage you to stop by our lightning talks where you can listen throughout the day to TED-style talks on international development topics that were competitively selected by a panel of judges. For those of you who like a good contest, you can wander our innovation gallery where five SID members were rigorously selected to showcase their innovations and from which a winner will be selected by all of you via our SID app. And Catherine will tell you more about that later. And last but not least, for those of you who like to mingle with friends and colleagues, old and new, we invite you to the exhibit hall where you can interact with more than 50 sponsors who have helped make this event possible. We could not do this without our sponsors. In particular, please make sure to stop by the Deloitte and Arizona State University booths to give them extra thanks for sponsoring at the Diamond level this year and providing extraordinary support to the conference. As a Diamond sponsor, Arizona State has prepared the following short video to share with you. So once again, thank you to ASU, to Deloitte, and to all of our sponsors. So last but not least, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to take a moment to recognize Ann Simmons-Benton for chairing the 2019 annual conference. Despite having a full-time job as executive director of ASU International Development and serving as Sid Washington secretary and board member, Ann gave 150% effort to design and organize this year's event. Anne's vision and leadership in this role is unmatched. 
together with the annual conference planning committee, Sid Washington President Katherine Rafelson and the Sid staff, this dream team has put in countless hours to develop the agenda, secure amazing speakers, and create a rich space for dialogue. Please join me in thanking Anne, the committee, Catherine, and all of their teams for their incredible work. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Tara Nathan. Tara brings uniquely qualified experience to kick off our conference where we will look at the wicked problems of development. She currently serves as Executive Vice President for the Humanitarian and Development Sector at MasterCard. During her tenure at MasterCard, she has led a number of transformational solutions for commercially sustainable social impact with a keen focus on serving those at the base of the pyramid. She's been critical in the launch of the MasterCard Aid Network, an end-to-end non-financial service designed to streamline aid distribution, even in the absence of telecommunications infrastructure. She's led efforts to advance new payment technologies to expand financial inclusion, government transparency, and economic formalization. And she has helped shape the thinking of leaders around the world through her role on the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on Humanitarian Response. In her early career, Tara was a diplomat in the US Foreign Service and is a graduate of the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. So we're thrilled she's able to return to her Washington roots today to excite and challenge us. You can read more about Tara's bio and the bio of all of our speakers on our app. So I'm gonna stop talking now and turn it over to Tara. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. So excited to be back here, uh, the home of not just my alma mater, but uh, I guess my first professional career with the State Department. So it feels like coming home, although it didn't feel that way when I got lost this morning trying to find the Ronald Reagan building. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to participate in your forum, and, um, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, MasterCard is a global fintech company. People think we're a credit cards company, and we're not. What we do is we lay digital infrastructure around the globe. We're present in over 210 countries and territories and markets around the world. We say it's more than the UN. Um, and what we do is we create interoperability, digital interoperability that connects banks and merchants and consumers in a way that makes all transactions very speedy, very quick, very simple, but most importantly, safe. Because we want to make sure that when you're having sensitive and, and secure, that the transactions are secure, that your data is secure, that your identity is secure. So that's what our core business is. Um, I think that's important because you, it's important to sort of make the segue into why we're up here and why I'm interested in speaking to you folks. Um, as a company, it's really in our DNA to leverage our core competencies for good and for social impact. You know, back in 2006, we uh, founded the MasterCard Foundation. It was actually a, I think, first in its kind type of uh, initiative where when we IPO'd, we took 10% of our stock and we set it aside for the foundation. At that time, it was worth $500 million. Today, it's worth over $23 billion. And each year, just in dividend payments alone, we basically replenish the original endowment, if you can think about the size of that. So our largest shareholder of MasterCard is the foundation, okay? Think about that for a second in terms of why, what drives our motivation. Uh, in our core business, if any of you have heard of our CEO speak, Ajay Banga, he has been talking about over the last 10 years really a core mission across MasterCard uh, to think of ourselves as a financial inclusion company. So we believe that what our mandate and mission is, is to leverage these capabilities to extend digital infrastructure for digital inclusion. Uh, we've made corporate commitments to include over 500 million uh, marginalized folks and new consumers into the formal financial sector, and we're well on our way to accomplish that objective. We've made targets about 40 million micro merchants and small enterprises trying to include them into the formal financial sector, and we're well on the way to that as well. I run a business, uh, I've changed the name of it over the course of the past eight years, depending on who I'm talking to, really. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's also represented, I think, an evolution of the space that we inhabit. Um, and I, it's interesting, you know, when, I, when I'm introduced as the head of the humanitarian and development sector, people sort of say, 
what? MasterCard has a humanitarian development sector lead. What my job is, I think I have the best job in the world. I have the ability, it's a social impact business. And so that social impact business is all about how do I innovate? How do I create new solutions, new products, uh, but new business models, new go-to-market mechanisms that allow us to leverage digital technology for social impact. So I'd like to uh, sh share a few perspectives with you today, not as a development expert, uh, because I, in this kind of crowd, I would never, uh, I would never uh, assert myself as one. Um, but hopefully the perspective of a large private sector company trying to do good in the world, and hopefully provoke a few thoughts and some ideas on how we can encourage more private sector companies to, to join us in this, in this world and this work that we do. It's interesting, um, you know, I thought long and hard about what I would, what I would say today, and uh, I, I think you folks know better than I do that these presentations always start with a series of slides with happy children and talking about how a billion people don't have ID and a hundred millions don't have education and, 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 and people haven't eaten and people are hungry, and, and, and I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about how the past two decades uh, have seen really unprecedented growth in global prosperity. People are richer. In 1981, some 42% of the world uh, was extremely poor. As of 2015, that number was only 10%. And today, someone escapes extreme poverty every 1.2 seconds. That's huge progress. People are healthier. The under five global mortality rate has reduced by 44% since 2000. And also that number of folks being diagnosed and dying from HIV AIDS has declined by 35%. People are better educated. Enrollment in primary education in developing countries has reached almost 91%. And almost two thirds of the countries have achieved gender parity in education. That advance, those advancements I would say in the development agenda has been really matched by a commensurate increase in the impact and in the role of the private sector over the past same 20 years. In 2000, the Global Compact was formed. Now about 13,000 companies have signed up to pledge, <clears throat> in addition to having their corporate missions, have pledged to have social missions alongside them. In 2006, we established the construct called the B Corp. And now you have companies like Warby Parker, uh, like Tom's Shoes, who are setting up their entire foundation based on a social mission. That's a lot of development, not just in development outcomes, but in private sector outcomes. I think we've come a long way from the 19th century sort of Robin Baron days where there was perhaps some healthy skepticism of the role of private sector and some of the role that, that it played in rapacious growth to where we are today. But I think there can be no doubt when you look at this trajectory and when we look at the progress that we've made, that uh, the sort of moral arc of humanity, of development, is towards prosperity and justice. That the moral arc of people is towards ethical behavior. <clears throat> now, when I talk about people, I want to be very specific. I'm not talking about public sector people. I'm not talking about NGO people. I'm not talking about humanitarian people. These are people. And the people who inhibit and who sort of empl are employed by the private sector are no different than those in the development halls. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So I'd like to start off with maybe a little discussion about the sustainable development goals. Uh, I actually had titled, I had titled each section on my, on, my, on my talk with a question. And the title of this is, what's up with the sustainable development goals? I said, uh, you know, I sort of get the development part. I think we're kind of light on the sustainable part. Uh, we ended up with what I perceive and what I talk about as a naive two-step plan. Uh, step one was set goals, 17 of them. Uh, step two was achieve them. And uh, I, you know, how many years in now, we're all shocked and surprised that we haven't made, that we're behind and we're not in, in line to actually achieve these goals. So what I wanted to do is maybe share with you Three, pers three ideas or three perspectives on, well, I guess one perspective, three points, on um, 
where maybe we're getting stuck up, where we're getting hung up here. I think first of all, we have a marketing problem. Uh, gloom and doom doesn't sell and it doesn't scale. I don't think we can guilt people into solving the big intractable issues that exist around the world. We should shift to a notion of opportunities. Opportunities attract private sector companies. Opportunities attract uh, people's imagination. I think the SDGs should inspire. We should be talking about how we collectively have an opportunity to create a world that is free from hunger, where everyone is educated, that's free from misogyny, that's free from hatred. That is the kind of thing that companies want to sign up for. That's the kind of vision that individuals can sign up for. I'd, I'd be curious for you to, if you haven't already maybe, and maybe you have, go home and talk to old colleagues or old friends who are outside of the development sector. Talk to your friends who are very educated, come from the top most schools, who work at the top most companies, Ask them what the SDGs are. They don't know. So how are we going to capture people's imaginations? I think it's really about inciting, as I said, this vision. Come one, come all, join our mission. Do great things, get recognized, and make money while you're doing at it. How's that for a vision to attract private sector companies to come join us? But we've sort of taken a little bit of a counterintuitive intuitive approach. Now, whether it's you know, speaking sort of on the mountains of, of Davos or in the UN plenary in the fora or in development fora, you know, the messages that we give and the messages that I hear as a private sector participant are uh, all about shame, uh, telling the private sector to step up, telling the private sector that they need to fill a funding gap, telling us that profit is suspect, and that we don't trust your intentions. Shame doesn't scale. It's not going to work. I think the second thought that I'd leave with you is the notion of, I think we have with the SDGs what I call a roles and responsibilities challenge. I think we can all agree that we're each good at some things and we're not so good at other things, right? We've got core competencies. We've got specializations. So when I think about this, right, what does a government do? Government protects citizens. Government creates an enabling environment for private sector to thrive. Government regulates. Civil society does a great job of stepping in when you have a failing government who can't provide for its citizens. Companies innovate. We deploy. We scale. We employ. Philanthropy fills the void when private sector can't invest or won't invest because it's not profitable yet. The challenge in our current humanitarian and development paradigm, as I see it, is that we've got these roles all mixed up. What we have is a situation where UN agencies, development organizations, and NGOs are innovating, governments are scaling, and companies are being asked to pay philanthropically. Uh, and I'm sure you all have seen the same, you know, paradigm that I have, where we now have blockchain experts emerging in UN organizations, and we've got donors funding payment schemes, and uh, NGOs are being asked to sort of scale banking platforms. I guess I would question this. Is there a room to better optimize and to get better outcomes through better roles and responsibilities? So thirdly, I think we have a go-to-market problem. So what's that go-to-market problem? And again, I'm I say this humbly because you folks in this room, when I read the list of participants, I was very impressed. And, and you do this day in and day out. I'm sort of a novice to it. But as far as I've been able to discern, what happens is donors come up and they establish thematic principles. They say, we want to deck $50 million against women or $100 million against resilience. Then there is some crazy RFP or granting process that takes 360 days or more to sort of win or get. And then once you get it, you got to spend the next year figuring out what resilience meant or what women meant. And then you sort of make an on-grant or an on-donation to another INGO, then it goes to another NGO, then it ends up with an implementer. And that's just for one program in that market. And then that is repeated five or six or seven, or in the case of Lebanon, 17 times, where you have 17 different program infrastructure sort of reaching a single beneficiary. What if instead we turned that model on its head? 
And we actually came up with a collaborative model for us to work together with the end beneficiaries, be they individuals or be they governments, to say, what are your objectives? Not at the level of saying resilience. I don't even know what that means. I speak many languages having been in the Foreign Service. I don't know what that means. Instead of saying resilience, what are your tactical problems? I, as a government, am trying to build my SME sector. Here is what I have. Here are the regulations I have. Here's the infrastructure I'm lacking. And then we partner together to actually come up with a tactical architecture that says, here are the gaps. Here's the go-to model. Here are the solutions that are required. Here are the solutions that exist. Not everything has to be in innovated. Not everything has to be made from scratch, right? How do we apply those into this context? And then how do we scale together? And then we bring in the donors to say, here's our great ecosystem plan for this project, growing M MSME growth or extending, extending mobile connectivity or extending access to power. This I would offer is potentially a new type of model that we should maybe consider. So I want to just assess in this light some of the challenges that we're facing today and maybe a little take on how MasterCard has approached it. So when we look at development challenges, we look at the 800 million people who go to bed hungry each night and say, why is there that 30% of global production is lost or wasted in the value chain each year? That's a distribution issue. It's an access to markets issue. And so what we've done is we've developed and built something called the MasterCard Farmer Network that gives smallholder farmers access to large agri-buyers, giving them greater, extracting greater, fairer prices for their produce and extracting rent from the value chain. Every year, millions of people die from diseases for which vaccines exist. Why? Because the process for tracking vaccinations is very paper-based and manual. So often, we don't know who's getting the vaccine, if they're getting two doses or if five people are getting one dose, and so there's no way to measure it. We've created, and working together with the Gavi Alliance, something called the Wellness Pass that creates essentially a digital ID that tracks your vaccinations and gives those people living in marginalized community the ability to better uh, receive and track their medications. 250 million people can't go to school. Why? Often because, it's a very simple reason, in some markets they're paying, let's say, $50 per annum to attend school, but for them that $50 is insurmountable. They need to make small, tiny micropayments, sometimes in the form of 50 cents, $1 type of payments. We've enabled a capability that enables schools to track student attendance, track teacher attendance, and match it with parents' micropayments. So in these examples, you can see, we're not looking at these challenges as a funding gap. We're not looking at gaps of funding, but what we're trying to do is find areas where we can use approaches to greater efficiency, to tackle opportunities to create scalable change. I think collectively, we fundamentally need to shift, our, shift the paradigm and stop talking about a funding gap, focus on an efficiency gap, and a commerciality gap. I think I may have made up that word, commerciality gap. We need to stop thinking about problems and start thinking about opportunities and think of the private sector as a partner and as an enabler. So how do we do this? I think the answer to me is better leveraging and better utilization of the private sector. So it's better leveraging and better utilization of the private sector. I mean, one of the examples that I love the most is the M-PESA example, where it was actually a co-creation, right, from a, I think a million dollar grant from DFID, and then there was an investment from Vodafone. And it basically grew into what is now a half a billion dollar company that makes th like 30 million users and it transacts or it processes like 60% of Kenya's GDP. I mean, huge. That started from a public-private partnership. I'm very interested and we're very interested at MasterCard on how we can scale these sorts of collaborations. Because if you thought that it was hard to get through a USAID RFP process or a grant process of 360 days, try to set up one of these public-private collaborations. It is laborious, right? How do we start to scale this? One of the things we did in conjunction with USAID's Power Africa is we launched the Smart Communities Coalition. 
Uh, the Smart Communities Coalition has a number of key sort of large private sector partners like Accenture, like Microsoft. Um, we have NGO partners like Mercy Corps, World Vision, and we have influencers like the GSMA and other entities. We also have a lot of local private sector entities. But the main thought behind Smart Communities Coalition is to create a new sort of cluster system, if you will. Not a cluster system that is convening UN with UN with UN, but a cluster system that's combining private sector, public, uh, private sector governments, and the civil society. And it's meant to be a go-to-market capability that can start to tear down some of these barriers, these operational, legal, uh, procedural, commercial types of barriers that we face. So we invite you, in conclusion, I'd say, invite you to join and join us with the Smart Communities Coalition. I think we have an opportunity if we partner together, if we think about things in new ways, if we think about commerciality and sustainability and scalability first, I think we have the opportunity to do really disruptive and large scale change um, and uh, to achieve that brilliant world that we talked about at the very beginning, right? the world that's free from hunger, that's free from poverty, that's free from hate. Um, so with that, I thank you. Uh, so how's that as a way to start your thinking and start your, uh, start your brains with a lot of questions? I promised that she would excite and challenge us, and I think that's exactly what Tara did. So we would like to open it up for questions. We've got mics um, that are stationed um, around the room, and we have a question right here. Can you go to a mic, please? Yeah, right behind you. Great. You could just say your name and your organization. Kevin Murphy, uh, J. E. Austin Associates. Unconditional tra cash transfers. What can MasterCard do? What can the rest of us do? Um, it seems like just throwing a little extra Starbucks money over the transom, if enough people did it, could solve poverty for the under 600 million people that are still there. But when, when I do it, I have to do it through a bank transfer. I have to do it through um, uh, go to CVS and send money to really poor families in South Sudan or or um, uh, Uganda, or um, uh, Mozambique, or wherever. But there must be a way that we could figure out how MasterCard or other companies that are involved in, in f digital financial transfers could make it work, uh, as GiveDirect does, or GivingDirect. They're, they're doing that, but just in some countries where they can transfer money digitally. But if you don't have a phone, and you're not in Uganda, Kenya, and uh, a few other countries, what can we do? to build this bridge so that people that want to share some of their extra cash with really, really poor families, the under $1.90 crowd, could do so. I'm, I'm sure you must have some insights and have done a lot of thinking about that. Thank you, Tara. Hello, hi, thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah, we've done a lot of work in uh, conditional and unconditional cash transfers. Um, obviously, I think our core business is really about enabling those types of digital transactions. I think the first thing that we need to do is, going back to sort of my comments, enabling digital payments around the globe to your question and to your point. If you're trying to do it on a bilateral corridor, it's very simple. Or it's not very simple, but it's much simpler. But what you're proposing is exactly the end state vision that we imagine, which is how can anyone in any donor country at an individual level facilitate a transfer to any person in a recipient country? The short answer is we're doing it already in many environments through vehicles such as prepaid cards. We partner with organizations like the World Food Program, with Mercy Corps. Um, we, uh, some of the work we've done via the Humanitarian Aid Network actually facilitates those cash transfers. Um, either on, in an offline environment or in an online environment, so we're doing it. <clears throat> in order to make it truly scalable and global, though, what we need to do is convince donors that this needs to happen at an infrastructure level. It can't happen at a program level. What does that mean? Payment rails are things that need to be built. There's 
And when I say built, I'm not talking about right, concrete and, and, and shovels. But there are all kinds of both technology rails that need to be laid. There are also uh, regulatory challenges that need to be overcome. There are operational challenges. So I think what we need to do is effectively work with donors to say that we want to create this infrastructure once and that we want to leverage it multiple times. It is some of the work that we are doing through the Smart Communities Coalition, which focuses on uh, rails across three dimensions, power, digital tools, and uh, connectivity rails. So that is the exact work that we're trying to do, working at an ecosystem level, crowding in uh, private and public uh, actors, and then bringing donors along to, to fund that. Great, thank you. We have a couple more questions. Um, so if you could please just be brief in asking your question. Just make it brief and to the point, please. We'll go here, and then we'll go over there. Hi, uh, Patricia DeVecchio, International Purpose. Uh, thank you, Tara, very, very much. Uh, I think you're right on in terms of uh, the changes that are needed. So I'd like a suggestion from you uh, in terms of how do we, as the industry in the sense of international development, begin to change that business model that we operate from, that's really antiquated, that's really based in the past, uh, that needs to change if we want this new future, you know, if we want this new belief system about prosperity for all. Uh, a suggestion would be uh, yeah. helpful. Thank you. I think my suggestion is pretty straightforward. I think as you're tackling an issue or you get a grant or you have an R, you know, you've got an RFP that you've just won or you're trying to tackle something, think about the sector you're in, the solutions that would be relevant, and I guarantee you there are half a dozen, 50, 100 private sector companies who already have expertise in this area. Reach out. And if you don't know who they are, call me and I'll help you get in touch with them. And if you want to figure out how to talk to them, come to the breakout session this afternoon on how to figure out how to talk to the private sector in the same language. Great. Over here, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. My name is Beatrice Wame. I work with Nason Solutions, and we do a lot of education programs in very remote parts of Africa. You touched on something, the digital tools for tracking student attendance, teacher attendance, and probably parental engagement. We are really excited at that kind of approach because the paper-based uh, tracking tools that we have are vulnerable to um, mismanagement, if, if, I'm, if I don't want to call the bad word. But I'm trying to see, uh, are you thinking of how these digital tools can get to the ends of the world, especially where we are working? Because when we talk about innovation, most, most often we are thinking about the bells and whistles, which are not practical, where some of us were. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Uh, <coughs> we actually, so the solution I talked about is called Kupa, and it's actually currently deployed in Uganda in very, very remote districts, I would tell you. Uh, <clears throat> and you're spot on. What it does is it digitizes, not only does it facilitate for the parent the ability to make those micropayments, which is the one aspect I talked about, but what we're finding is an even bigger win is for the government district worker, who's now able to have visibility into, you said the monies that were mismanaged, we call it theft. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> that the, the money that's just leaving and walking away. Uh, and what the government stakeholders are now telling us is they have the ability to see on a school-by-school -school basis, because often in Uganda, right, they have a, what they call a parent contribution to a publicly funded uh, uh, education. Um, they're able to see how that ratio differs from school to school to school. They're able to see how many students are being claimed, how many teachers are showing up, and if their remuneration, right, is, is actually correctly tied to it. So, um, and, and it's currently being deployed in, in Uganda, and we're hoping to to spread all over Africa. Thank you. We have one other question here. Thank you. I'm Erin Andine with Palladium International, and thank you, Tara, a really interesting presentation. Um, I want to start with your made-up word, commerciality, commerciality gap. Um, Master's, MasterCard, in recognizing that there's a need for these sustainable and scalable solutions that are commercially viable, um, is, is unique among American companies. Not the only one, but there are, are certainly many companies that if they know what SDGs are, 
that's in the foundation type world or the corporate, corporate social responsibility world. So I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on how, not development companies represented in this room, but how you know, um, companies like MasterCard um, can move from CSR strategies to really commerciality focused uh, strategies. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's a great question. I think um, it's not gonna, there's a, there is a natural evolution that's happening and that's what I sort of tried to refer to, I believe in the beginning of, of my speech, right? Which is we see an evolution towards social mindedness and that's being driven uh, some by inspired leaders in the case of MasterCard, but some really, frankly, by our workforce. Um, there was a recent Edelman poll that said 76% of all employees actually look to their CEOs and to their companies to influence social change in the world more than their governments, okay? Uh, so that is a natural tide that's happening. I think our employees, our people are pushing us to say, as companies, we need to have, we need to take a, a stand. But the simple answer is, it'll, I'll go back to the previous answer I, I, I gave. If we wanna bring more companies in, we have to show the opportunity. We can't keep saying, give me money, and we can't say, you need to do this or else, or if you don't do this, we'll hate you and we'll shame you. I think it needs to say, hey, here's a proposition for you. You have this product and solution. How about you give it to me, let's say initially at cost, at a subsidized rate, but here's the path to you actually making money or opening a market or gaining favor with a government or getting marketing appeal or I'll help you get branding or, or, or. You'll have companies lining up. But right now, right, the conversation is the exact inverse. Prove to me you're not gonna gain anything from this. Prove to me you're not gonna put your brand anywhere. Prove to me you're never gonna make any money. Prove to me that anybody you know is not gonna make any money, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. So I, I think that needs to shift. So I think that was an awesome response for the final question that we can take at this point in time. And you have really set us up for a great challenge today about how we can figure out how to do more, how to collaborate better, and how to start to really speak the same language so that we can change the, uh, change the paradigm of the way that we think about development, embrace uh, what the private sector is doing, what USAID administrators doing in terms of pushing forward the private sector engagement strategy. And uh, I'm excited for all of us to take what we've learned from Tara and bring that forward into the rest of the conference. So please join me, everyone, in thanking Tara Thank you. for this morning. Thank you.